Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the inaugural Phil Matthew Water Forum. Thank you all for joining us for what promises to be a stimulating afternoon. Before introducing our speaker and agenda, I'd like to set the scene for our distinguished lecture and panel sessions. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Dustin Garrick, and I'm brand new here to McMaster University and the Hamilton community. I started in January of this year as the Philomathia Chair in Water Policy, which is a unique joint appointment between the Department of Political Science and the Faculty of Social Science and the Center for Engineering and Public Policy, which is facing the Faculty of Engineering. My research investigates policy responses to the global water crisis, and particularly focusing on strategies to deal with water scarcity and extreme climate events. Most of my work has been in Australia and Western North America, which are two regions that are arguably at the leading edge of what is a global challenge. I'm truly delighted to join McMaster, to join Hamilton, and the Canadian research community in helping to solve local water challenges and engaging global dialogues. Before introducing our speaker, I want to acknowledge that this is a historic moment. Water and water security have emerged and been recognized as a defining challenge of this century. Almost 800 million people remain without access to safe drinking water and billions without improved sanitation. Yet these challenges are not far from home. We confront the public health threats from water pollution here in Canada and many other issues which we'll be discussing today. On top of these challenges, are the impacts of climate variability and extremes as a threat multiplier, causing shocks that disrupt livelihoods, economies, and ecological well-being. We need look no further than the flooding in Calgary and Toronto last year to see the impact of extreme climate and weather events. And the perception is catching up with the reality. The World Economic Forum has identified water shocks among the top five concerns for global leaders for the past three years running. Water is increasingly viewed as the thread that binds together our climate, our food, our energy systems in a globalizing society, and one that's increasingly urban. In Canada, water is central to a blue economy that supports drinking water for our cities, food production, and agriculture, energy, and ecosystems. It is against this backdrop that science, policy, and industry is happening from the nanoscale to the global supply chains of managing water stress and water challenges. Canada has been tabbed as the solutions country by the Blue Economy Initiative in an attempt to join alongside pioneers and global leaders in the Netherlands, Australia, Israel, and elsewhere. I've been, it's been a great pleasure to learn of the research happening here at McMaster, at the UN University, and also with regional partners throughout southern Ontario and Canada about the research that's happening from our backyard in Hamilton Harbor, its international partnerships with China with the Arctic and here in the Great Lakes. The Philomathia Foundation created the Water Project at McMaster in 2012. Now, Philomathia means the love of learning, and the Water Project is founded on the three pillars of research excellence, pushing the frontiers of education for the next generation of leaders and engaging our community both locally and globally. In charting our course for the project's next phase, Today's session aims to take stock of the major challenges for water security to ensure that our science is responding to the policy challenges and to the challenges in industry. We will close this afternoon's session with an exciting announcement about the formation and next steps for McMaster Water Network that connects science, technology, and policy to deliver local and global impacts in partnership with the community and industry. I can think of no one better to help frame these challenges and the opportunities for science than Professor David Gray, whom I'm proud to call a colleague, a mentor, and a friend. Professor Gray visits us from Oxford University, where I was based before joining McMaster this year. And he's had a career over the last 40 years working in the field on water and development challenges, living and working in Asia, Africa, the Americas, and Europe, with field work in over 70 countries. He spent 27 years with the World Bank we held many positions, ending as the bank's senior water advisor, providing substantive oversight of large water portfolio and large staff. In addition to this work as a practitioner, it's important to note that his published work has been enormously influential in water policy and development. For example, his recent work has been focused on water security. It was presented for the first time in Mexico in 2006 as part of the World Water Forum and has since been cited by 
U.S. Congress, policymakers in South Africa, and Mexico, and beyond, and by business leaders in the World Economic Forum's Task Force on Water Security. Now, David will mention that he claims to be retired as of four years ago, uh, but he has since worked at Oxford, also at the University of Exeter, in developing interdisciplinary water science leader, uh, uh, initiatives, and also with the institutional of uh, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis based in Vienna. He advises governments in water management development, including in Asia, Middle East, and Africa, and he was in the Mekong Basin last week in Southeast Asia. For McMaster, he goes to Harvard for, to give his annual lecture series there, and he is in Africa's foreign Zambezi and Nile Basin later this month. So if that uh, journey, an international tour, doesn't make you tired, uh, we, we can all call upon ourselves to join me in thanking and welcoming Professor Gray to give this keynote lecture on water security. I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Garrick, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to be here at the launch of the McMaster Water, Water Network um, here in Canada, here with my friend Dustin. I'd like to congratulate um, Dr. Chung and the Philomathia Foundation for their inspired gift. I had the chance to meet Dr. Chung this morning, and he inspired me with the motivation behind the gift. Um, I'd like to congratulate McMaster for launching this network. And I'd like to congratulate my friend, Professor Dustin Garrick, uh, the new Philomathia Chair of Water Policy. I've worked in many countries, but I've never actually worked on water in Canada. But I have worked with many, many Canadians over my career. I spent quite a bit of time in Canada with, with the government, um, with the with CEDA, for example, going back maybe 30 years, working in the Middle East on water resources, working in Africa, working in Asia. I was the manager of the UNDP World Bank Water and Sanitation Program. Canada was one of our primary partners. I worked closely with the IDRC. Um, I, at different times, had interactions with the, with the big hydropower agencies, uh, BC Hydro, um, Ontario, and so on. So um, it's a pleasure to be back. I'm a policy wonk. Um, if, so in my title, 21st Century Water Security, Challenges for Science, for Society and Science, I, I've, I've labeled science in, in quotes. I've labeled it in, in quotes because when I use the word science, I mean every kind of science, from engineering science and, and anthropological science, economic science, natural science, social science, um, economic science, and so on. And I include in that technology and technology development. Um, Dustin's below me a bit on this, but um, that's my understanding and the way in which I'm using the term. Um, science without policy is science, but I, policy without science is gambling. And I've spent an awful lot of my career as a, as a policy wonk gambling, because the science foundation for much of the policy prescription that I have been involved in, in working with many governments, has not been based on a sound scientific foundation. And, and that's a very important point. And I, it, it sounds funny, but, but it's serious. Science without, sorry, policy without science is gambling. Neil Armstrong looked back from, from, the, from, from the moon and he said, I see one blue planet, one blue planet um, in our solar system. Um, in the universe, there may be others, but we only have one in our solar system. Of the blue, um, and I suspect we can't see that, and um, I'm not a sufficient position or a climate changer to be able to move the sun. Um, and I can't remember the numbers, but, but take my word for it as we, as we go through this, that somewhere around, much less than point much less than 1% of the water on this planet that we have is liquid and fresh. It's closer to 0.1%. And, and it's because of that 0.1% that we're here. We as a species depend on that 0.1%. And I'm going to come back to this later because we have no idea what's happening in the future. We have no idea what is happening in the future to that 0.1% upon which we as a species depend. Um, in coming here, I had to refresh my memory, so I spent a bit of time on the web looking at some numbers, trying to remind myself about Canada and how well you are endowed with water. 
But how many problems we face? So, running through this quickly, half of the world's population, but 7% of the world's renewable freshwater resources, third after, after Brazil and Russia, so 15 times the average per capita in this country over any other country. Consumption of 325 litres per capita per day, that's the second highest in the world. It's twice that of Europe, and you pay about half as much for it as Europeans do. do. You have 11% of the world's installed hydroelectric power. Um, that's the third highest in the world. You generate 18,600 kilowatt hours per capita per year. Um, that's the third highest. 94% of that's domestic use, 17,500 kilowatt hours per capita per year. Now, uh, many African countries, that number is about 50, so it's worth bearing in mind. But you have water shortages. Most of your rivers have flown north. Um, most of your population, a large part of your population, is around the Great Lakes. But there's some inspirational stuff going on in Canada, despite the fact that you could easily be complacent. But you're not, mostly, I suspect. I suspect there are areas of complacency, and perhaps this will come up in the panels. Um, this charter is quite inspirational. This idea of Canada as a water solutions country that can project its ideas and findings, its technologies, its skills across the world. But in the same document, the description here of the state of the assets in Canada with 40% of wastewater assets in poor, in poor to fair condition. So the replacement costs of assets that are, that are in less than good condition totaling out at $80 billion. So that's the, that's the needed reinvestment in assets today in Canada, taken out of this document from 2013. Um, my themes today, um, what is water security and why does it matter? It's all about risk. A current world of risks, I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour around the world of a whole host of, of risk stories, almost all of which I'm involved in or have been involved in, in one way or another. I'm going to speak about the very perverse world in which we live, where the, we live in a divided world. I'll, I'll, I'll hold the punchline until later. Um, changing climates, and I mean climates, demographic climates, political climates, um, um, and of course physical climates, economic climates. Going into a future world, policy questions for science, without questions, um, if you don't know where you're going, any, any road will take you there. Building the Science Foundation for Policy. A coalition of the willing, science, policy, and business. Uh, this is an ancient wisdom. I've got half a dozen Chinese ancient wisdoms that I use quite a lot in my work. And this wisdom, Chuning Zaiju, Yineng Fuzhu, means not only can water float a boat, it can sink it also. Moral of this, water can help, it, can, it is productive, and it can harm. It can be destructive. And if we look at this, so um, I'm struggling reading, reading my own text, but, but essentially water is a source of growth and cooperation, healthy people, healthy ecosystems, food production, energy production, navigation, cultural value, and cooperation. So water, an enormous power for, for growth, cooperation, production. But water also a source of destruction, poverty and dispute, drought, flood and inundation, landslide, desertification, contamination, epidemic and disease, and dispute and even conflict. So water security, and I've got a couple of definitions, policy objective, it's a policy objective, policy outcome, an objective at all scales from the local to global for all actors. An old definition, it's a definition from a paper I wrote with a colleague back in 2002 initially, then published in 2007. The availability of an acceptable quantity and quality of water for health, livelihoods, ecosystems and production, and an, ex and an acceptable level of water-related risks to people, environment and economies. So the two sides of the coin, productive and destructive. A new risk anchored in risk science, sorry, a new definition anchored in risk science coming from my time with my colleagues, working with my colleagues in Oxford where a number of, number of us work on infrastructure risk. Um, tolerable level of water related risk to society, published in a 2013 art, journal article, 
and the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Um, each of these words is loaded. Security, confidence, protection, freedom from danger. Tolerable is an important word in risk science. Tolerable is not acceptable. Tolerable is not acceptable. Tolerable is a, is a, a cost-benefit. It's the point at which you would spend the next dollar reducing another risk. Um, it's culturally specific. It's, it's a fairly wide range. It's an ally is another word used in, in, in risk science. As low as reasonably practicable with the intention of constantly reducing the risk into the future. Um, but it's not unacceptable. Water-related risks are the upside benefits of water and the downside impacts. And the society and aggregate of people in a community in, in, from the individual and the, and the family and the farm and the firm and, and, the, and the city and the nation to the region and the planet, um, including all needs and values, culture and ecosystems and so on, all about managing water-related risk. So I'm going to talk about risks fairly speedily. This will be a whistle-stop tour. Um, Dustin mentioned the household water sanitation held 800 million without access to clean water, 2.5 billion without toilets. 2.5 billion without toilets. I was giving a keynote at IASA in Vienna um, at, on the 40th anniversary and I followed a Nobel Prize winning economist who spoke about the fact that the world population will probably peak at around 9 billion, but it could go to 11 billion um, if, and the if was if women are not educated. Now, most girls, most schools in Africa and South Asia either don't have toilets or don't have to toilets that are suitable for girls. And by suitable for girls, I mean they have doors and they're not full um, and they're not lined with boys. So I spoke to him afterwards and I said, you know, you're not going to educate women unless we can get toilets into schools. And he said, you're telling me there aren't toilets in schools that girls use? And I said, no, no, I'm probably one and a half Probably a billion, probably a billion girls don't have access to toilets. And he said, wow, and the economics of that is extraordinary. Because the implications of 11 billion, not 9 billion people on the planet is enormous for, for security purposes, um, for the distribution of the, of the assets that we have, the scarce resources that we have, and so on. Um, 7 billion people in cities by 2050, that's... That's seven times the population, I think it's seven times the population of 2050. And yet we continue to use technologies developed in 1870 by, by Chadwick for, in London to sewer cities. Can we possibly sewer new cities with seven billion people? The cost implications of this are enormous, and I'll come back to that. If, if, we, can, if we can reduce the water consumption in part by using other, other tools and technologies, we can save several trillion, several trillion dollars, and we can save trillions of kilowatt hours in energy in pumping water into cities. A billion mal malnourished. The, the challenge of, of food production. I put in here. I lived in India until 2009. I was based out of India, working across Africa and Asia. Um, 300 million hectares of irrigable land on this planet, 100 million of those hectares are in India, so one third of the global total. But India produces very little per hectare, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, typically, in the poorer states of India, in Bihar, in UP, one and a half tons of, of rice or wheat, and those numbers are 10 tons, 11 tons, even 12 tons in some Asian countries. So as a, it, it produces at no more than a third of a regional good performer. The best, the best states of India, like the Punjab, at four and a half tons. Uh, the reason for this has got nothing to do with par farmer performance. It's largely structural. It's to do with land tenure, rural infrastructure, uh, rent-seeking by irrigation agencies, uh, the, the absence of, of incentives for private sector engagement, in fact, barriers to private sector engagement. So multiple barriers to improve performance. But if you double the performance of irrigation in India, you will substantially increase food production globally. Oh, what have I done? Um, this last science and technology policy, all the way through I'm thinking about what are the science and the policy implications. A little experiment in Oxford in a tent um, pushing CO2 and water vapor 
to produce cellulose. A plant doesn't use it uses very little water to actually produce cellulose. It uses the, the water to open the stamen to photosynthesize CO2. And CO2 is very scarce in the atmosphere, even at 400 ppm. Uh, water vapor is much less scarce. So it uses plenty of water to photosynthesize CO2. If you do it in a, in, in a closed space, you use less than 0.1% of the most efficient irrigation on the planet. So do we need water to grow food? Not much, not much. Do we have the technology today? No, we don't. Is the science available to solve this problem? Yes, it is. What are the, given that 70% of the, of the world's water use is in food production, and we only need 0.1% of that for, to, to incorporate in the, in the molar formula for, for chlorophyll. Question, science, technology. So local flood risks, 2007 monsoon, I was living in India, four and a half thousand people died, 70 million people in 260 districts affected, this is India and Bangladesh, on, mostly on the Ganges, and 7,500 square kilometers of crops, crops destroyed, so a huge scale. A friend of mine, Sunita Narain, who's a pundit, wrote in the, uh, an op-ed in Indian press saying she read more about floods in Padstow in England at the same time as this monsoon where one person died and a few cars were washed into the sea by a landslide than she read in the Indian press about the monsoon. Because you accommodate with this. This is the monsoon. This is what happens every year in India. Does it need to happen? There's no early warning systems. There's nothing that you, that you need in order, in order to be able to avoid this. I'll come back to that later. Pakistan, the 2007 monsoon, 2,000 people died, one, one, one and a half million homes destroyed, 20 million people seriously affected, 10 to 20 billion dollars of economic loss. Followed the following year by more monsoon, people who were still in camps and hadn't gone home were once again affected by rains. Followed again in 2012. Now this hasn't happened on this scale before. Thailand, 2011 floods. Under a thousand died, one and a half million homes damaged, seven and a half thousand industrial plants damaged, 25% of the rice crop destroyed, $45 billion economic loss, $45 billion economic loss. The, the insurance payout was $15 billion, Lloyds of London paid out $5 billion and declared a loss of one and a half billion dollars, oh, sorry, $4 billion that year and declared a loss of one and a half billion. So when we look at the, the Calgary floods, which I think was $3 billion, and the insurance payout less than a billion, or around a billion, if I remember, I was reading in the press a couple of days ago. So, a huge scale, and I'll come back to this one again in a moment too. Inadequate warning or response, that's the Toronto storm, 300,000 without power in, in July of last year, just up the road. Um, science implications, science and technology, policy implications, what are they? Local droughts, the Horn of Africa, we would have seen on our television screens. I lived in Kenya for many years, my first child was born there, so I know East Africa very well. 2010 to 11 drought, 15 million needed aid, 30, 350,000 people in, in one particular camp moving in and out, one camp. 29,000 children under five died in 90 days. These numbers were too big, I mean, they were too big to put in our papers because they were too unacceptable. The numbers are too big to absorb, to understand. The consequence in Somalia with Al-Shabaab, um, the consequence of instability, the, the feedback loops into instability. In Syria, my daughter lived in Syria for several years. She currently lives in Libya. And she was telling me during this period about the drought and about people moving into, Ma into Damascus where she lived. So drought, several years of drought, rural livelihoods collapsed, people moving into cities, Little education, Sunni, um, no jobs, urban unrest, urban unrest leading to urban strife, urban strife leading to civil war, which is what we have now, Syrian civil war leading to battleships, destroyers of both Russia and the USA in the Mediterranean facing each other, daring each other, is the US going to, going, going to send rockets in or not? So a drought, possibly, possibly shifting into much, much broader conflict. The Russian drought in 2010, which I've already mentioned, the wheat harvest, the, the wheat harvest down, um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm actually jumping the gun a bit. I'm going to go back to the Russian drought. So the Russian drought, wheat harvest down 40%. So on, in August of 2010, and that's what this slide says, this is August the 5th, Russia bans wheat exports for the remainder of 2010. Exports banned. What can we do to understand these events better? Better early warning, better distribution of food, foodstuffs and so on. So transboundary risks now, this is the space that I've spent a lot of the last 10 or 15, maybe 20 years working in um, on international waters and dispute resolution. In almost all the basins in which I work, there's uncertainty, uh, there's limited knowledge and capacity, there's no shared information, there's no shared models, there's almost no sharing of science. Um, there are fears, misperceptions. Um, misunderstandings, misunderstandings breed fear, fear breeds unstable international relations and um, that you can't really see it, that's the third pole, the, the, the greater Himalayas, the rivers of the greater Himalayas the Yellow, the Yangtze, the Mekong, the, 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 the sorry, the Mekong, the Salween, the Irrawaddy, the Brahmaputra the Ganges, the Indus the Amudarya, the Siddharya three and a half billion people depend on these rivers, half the world's population has no cooperation Almost no institutions, almost no science above the, above the snow line. The IPCC had got it wrong. We have no idea what's going on above the snow line, but half the world's population depend on these rivers. Um, so there's a presumption in Bangladesh that you build dams in Nepal and it'll stop the floods in Bangladesh. It won't. There's a presumption that what China is doing in, in, in building hydro on the upper Brahmaputra will destroy India and Bangladesh. It won't. There's a perception that the China dams on the upper Mekong, on the, on the Lansang River in China, um, are causing downstream floods. They don't. Um, in Africa, the Nile, this great iconic river, six and a half thousand kilometers long, the longest river in the world, um, there's a perception that any development, and you can't read these, but take it for granted, that's a, that's a model map of the Nile, um, that if you were to take water out around Lake Victoria, that would damage Egypt, it won't. Because the water flows into a great swamp in the middle where a thousand billion cubic meters of water evaporates ten times the flow of the Nile at the Egyptian border. Um, but whose water is that, by the way? I mean, whose water, who does that belong to? And that feeds the atmospheric cycle. All of these countries believe that water is sovereign, it's ours. And I'll come back to that point in a moment too. Sovereignty. Sovereign secrecy. So also, I'm not going to give you my map data. I'm not going to give you. In India, the Ganges Basin, 650 million people live in the Ganges Basin. One person in 12 on the planet lives in one river basin. And topographic data is secret. You cannot buy top of the maps of the Ganges Basin. And we have Google Earth, but you can't buy top of the maps. Euphrates, I'm in and out of Baghdad quite a lot at the moment, three times last year. Um, 8,000 years of civilization, the invention of the wheel, the oldest cuneiform script that we have on the planet, and the, and the Euphrates is dying. So the water quality of the Euphrates, the presumption isn't about quantity, it's not, it's about salt. We've got the Australians working with us, and we're looking at, at salt management and salt mitigation and salt training. Um, but unless something happens, all rural livelihoods in, in Iraq will collapse completely. And the consequence of that is unthinkable. Iraq without the Euphrates and the Tigris, is no different to Saudi Arabia, but many times the population. The problem is northern science. So where I come from, all of our models, all of our tools, from economic models used by the IMF to climate models, this is, this is the Nile. Um, and just, you can see the green and the red. The green is, the, these are, these are um, GCMs, uh, global, global Circulation Models, they're all credible models. And these are a whole set of models of the Nile out to uh, 20, 2060 or thereabouts. 2050, 2060. Red shows that the precipitation will drop by 200 millimeters, and blue shows that it will increase by 200 millimeters. So you're a policymaker trying to plan for the future. It may, it may increase significantly, it may drop significantly. You, now use the same models in Europe, and we're getting very good correlations. But in Africa, they don't work, and they don't work in South Asia. Science. We don't have the science. Science and policy. Um, Water security, global spillover risks to stability. So, 
uh, urban services. I, I spoke about the Syria drought. Let me come to the Russian drought. So the Russian ban, Putin banned on August the uh, 15th, I think it was, of 2010. Um, in January, prices had doubled on the streets in Tunisia. A young Tunisian immolates, burns himself to death. Riots on, on the streets. The Tunisian government collapses within a few days. Food riots in Egypt. Three weeks later, Mubarak's government collapses. Riots in the Yemen. So the uh, several, several Nobel Prize winners have written about public rage because of food prices causing or being a major trigger for the Arab Spring. So something in Syria results in an outcome in Tunisia. Um, Pakistan floods. Government failure to provide social services, fundamentalist groups providing those services. There's been a lot out there in the intelligence community about Taliban recruiting as a consequence of the floods. Science and policy. Global spillover risks to business. Retired floods, I mentioned those. 20 bit, I mentioned those losses. Well, you couldn't buy hard drives. You couldn't buy computers for several months because a large proportion of hard drive production um, was in Thailand, Western Digital and Seagate. Um, Nikon and Canon. You couldn't buy a Christmas present for your son or daughter that Christmas. Uh, you couldn't buy a Nikon or a Canon for a camera. camera. Um, Toyota. The 260,000 vehicles down on production, 56% down on global revenue. The Japanese GDP down by 0.3 of a percent just six months after the tsunami. US Honda production down by 50% because of a flood in Thailand. A presumption by these investors that they were getting first world infrastructure, roads and railways and airports, but paying third world labor prices, so a good, a good deal. But they didn't bargain for third world institutions and the failure to take the right action at the right time. Um, government promising a $10 billion uh, water management plan, business saying we're not sure. The insurance industry completely restructuring. This was a paradigm shift, described as a paradigm shift in FDI, foreign direct investment, all risks insurance. Flood is always taken out of all risks insurance now. Now, single line command in Thailand. Only one agency is responsible for regulating, re regulating reservoirs with, with flood warnings. At, at this time, the Thais themselves were saying 80 agencies needed to be involved in re-regulating reservoirs at the time of this flood. Um, so this is the World Economic Forum Global Risk Survey 2014, published in January. And water's right up there. The, 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 the x-axis is the... Sorry, the, the y-axis is impact. The x-axis is the likelihood of the event. Y-axis is the scale of the impact. So water, very high impact and very likely. And above it, you can see fiscal crises and climate change. Uh, water didn't figure on this map six or seven years ago. But there's a growing understanding in business that unless they get water right in many, many ways, it's a massive risk to business. Um, so you've got all sorts of other things on this. There's, there is food, um, terrorist attacks right down there, uh, failure of critical in infrastructure right down at the bottom, water right up in the upper right. Risks to international relations. So the UN Convention, very unusual, 27 years in committee, in the International Law Committee. Uh, it, it, it was, the vote was in the UN General Assembly in, in 1997. So what's that? That's 17 years. Um, it's never been 17 years between a vote and ratification. Requires 35 for entry into force. It's around 30 right now. There's a big push from a couple of NGOs trying to get small states like Liechtenstein to sign up. Um, but there's a, there's a message in there. What's that message? This is China. China shares 111 rivers and lakes with 13 neighboring countries and has very few, has no deals basically with any, any country except a couple of minor ones with Russia and with Kazakhstan. Um, China voted against the UN Convention. It's upstream, and its interpretation of the Convention was that it was a massive bias. Turkey voted against upstream. Three countries voted against upstream on the Tigris and Euphrates. Burundi voted against the top country on the Nile. The Mekong. Um, China and the US. So this is, these are spillovers. This is playing out in a, on a much wider stage. US and China facing off in the Mekong right now. Um, Indus, Pakistan, India, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Mekna, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. Uh, there's, there's Bhutan in there as well with, the, with Brahmaputra and China. 
River rivalry, water disputes, resource insecurity, and diplomatic deadlock in South Asia. These are two US military writers. Um, excluded from the South Asia Regional Cooperation Council, water is off the agenda, not to be debated. In South Asia, this bottom graph here shows the intra-regional trade as a share in the region's total trade. So in, in East Asia, it's about 15 to 16%, and in South Asia, it's about 2%. Um, and the argument is these sorts of things, like these issues over water, feed into a massively suboptimal economic outcome for the countries concerned. Um, I've mentioned this, and the Nile game I won't, I won't stay with. So a divided world, and this is a very, very important message. We, we woke up about 15 years ago to the fact that there's a problem here. I mean, the rainfall in Africa is 700 millimeters. It's 700 millimeters in Europe, so what's the problem? The problem is that in my country, it rains practically every day. In Africa, the 700 millimeter comes once, perhaps, in a short period, or it comes in two short periods, depending whether you're at the equator or in the tropic, and sometimes it doesn't come at all. Often it doesn't come at all. So it's, the problem is variability. Variable, unpredictable climate is extremely difficult to manage. It requires very, very high levels of investments in, inf in information, in institutions, and in infrastructure. And Africa can't afford it. The only parts of the world where we've got similar climate regimes where, which function in terms of water management, which function in terms of water management, are South Australia and the Southwest United States. And in both cases, massive external injections of skill and capital. And Africa needs a massive injection of skill and capital to move the agenda, and so does much of, much of Asia. I'll, I'll leave that graphic because it's too difficult and with this light. But this graphic, the, 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 this is Ethiopia, rainfall GDP and ang GDP. The, the yellow is rainfall variation around the mean. GDP growth is blue and purple is ang GDP growth. Now, hopefully you can see that they track each other. I'm the finance minister of Ethiopia and I'm planning my budget. But I've no idea whether it's going to rain or not next year. And everything depends on the rain. I, mean, I can remember living in India years ago and in the newspapers, the finance minister was constantly saying, every one of my budgets is a gamble on the monsoon. That's changed now. That's changed because of urban performance, urbanization, and, and an economic shift. And that's about economic structure. Rural India doesn't matter in terms of economic performance. It does matter in terms of society, because that's 700 million people. This is knowledge skilled of the skill gap in science. And you won't be able to read that because the sun is still with us. But essentially, what that shows is, is met stations for 10,000 square kilometers. The three countries across on the right, I think, are the Netherlands, uh, the United Kingdom, and can't read the third, but the others are African countries. So in the UK, where we have no variability and no complexity, complexity and we have absolute predictability, we, we've invested a huge amount in information. In Africa, the costs of running these systems are high, and it just hasn't been a sufficient priority, and there's no information. I'll, I'll skip past that too. I'm, I'm going to show a graphic, which will take me a moment, um, but I want to do it anyway. This is work in progress at Oxford, where we, we, we are involved with, McMa with McMaster and with a number of universities around the world, funded by the OECD and the Global Water Partnership, with funding from a, a group of donors to, to demonstrate the correlation between water security and economic growth. Um, we have two chairs. The first chair is the, the, the um, president of Liberia, um, Adam, Alan Shirley Johnson, who's an economist, he used to work with the United Nations. And she's, she's the first elected African female leader. And the second chair is, is um, Angel Guria, who's the head of the OECD and the former finance minister of Mexico. Um, and then announcing some of our preliminary results at the Singapore Water Week in a few months. <coughs> so risk equals hazard plus vulnerability. Um, and we're running an x-axis here, which is vulnerability. Hydro and we're calling that, we're calling the hazard hydrological complexity. And, as, and, sorry, that's the hazard, I beg your pardon. Uh, the hazard on the, on the x-axis, on the y-axis, investment in information, institutions, and infrastructure, what we call the three, the three ins. Now, you probably can't see that either. But um, believe me, what, the, the, the different colors, the red are the poorest countries in the world, the yellow are, are, low, are, are um, um, 
low to middle income, the blue are high to middle income, and the green are high income. Um, so the richest countries in the world are up in the top right, the poorest countries in the world are down in the bottom right, so they have the highest hazard and the highest vulnerability. The richest countries have the lowest hazard and the lowest vulnerability, but they've still invested a huge amount. And these are risk lines, but they, they, a key message here is that for countries that are way out on that x-axis, so they have a high level of hazard, that's an endowment, we can't change that. They cannot move from left to right, they can only move up by investment. And this, the point that's being made here is they have a hell of a long way to go. They have to invest a great deal to get into that space which is water security. And rich countries don't spend too much on these things, they stop spending when they would when there's another risk, that the next dollar will be spent on something else. Um, I'll pass that. Just quickly, this one. Uh, changing climates, the world's rising population, that's 1950 to 2050, projected growth in food production. We, we've seen all these numbers, lots, and uh, the, the, we all need to be concerned about these futures. This is water availability, 1961 to 90. This is in the, in the 2030s. That's in the 2050s. All of the red areas are going to be in extreme, scare, extreme stress. But, but, and this is terribly important, it's a crisis now for two to three billion people. Two to three billion people are maladapted now. We worry about climate change a lot. This is the point I flipped through earlier on, that a modern risk society, we have no worries about, of today. We worry about tomorrow and, and, and uncertainty. And we worry about how we got to where we are today. So the angst of who we are and how we became rich. Poor people worry about today. Don't worry about the past or the future. Um, so policy into science. How do we close this divided world gap? Game changes, rocket science. And I'm serious, I use the word rocket science quite a lot these days because it's clear to me when we look at energy efficiency, we can bring a, a spaceship into, in from space which is, which is 25,000 degrees on the outside wall and 40 degrees on the inside wall because we have astronauts on board. So across a 300 millimeter wall, we have a huge thermal gradient. Why can't we do that with houses? What would it, what would, if we put 50 people on Mars, what would we do with their water and their waste? How would we grow the food? Now, it, I see people smiling, you know, so what? But the Apollo mission, the Apollo mission was about the existential problem of nuclear weapons in space. And there was an unlimited budget. So science was brought to bear, and all of us, all of us have devices. You know, my, my iPhone is a device that's a, a spin-off from rocket science. So the importance of not using Schumacher's prescriptions of string and pieces of wood to solve these problems in poor countries, but state-of-the-art solutions, game-changing solutions, leapfrog solutions. Some big policy questions beyond local. And local has always been the sphere in which we've considered water. Water is sovereign, it's mine. It's not. Water is a flux, it moves. Unless you bottle it or you put it underground, it will move. So managing risks of a four degree future, water flux, the, the less than 1% is liquid and fresh, what's gonna to happen to that with a four degree temperature change? The 0.1% that's not locked. Much of the ice and, 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 and glaciers will go into the ocean anyway. Sea level rise will have less, less fresh, and fresh liquid water. What's gonna happen? We don't know. Pathways to water security, local to global inno innovation in information. And I put GPG, it's a global public good for the first time in human history. Global public good means it's non-excludable and non-rival. We don't compete for it and we cannot be excluded from it. We can get it from space. So countries that argue this is secret and they're not going to share it, it doesn't matter. We don't, need, we don't need to get it from countries anymore. We can do it anyway. Institutions and infrastructure. And from infrastructure, I mean the, the widget that you need to measure something through to large scale. These trillion dollar challenges, ensuring water services for nine to 11 billion, seven to eight billion people in cities. And the energy implications of that and the food implications of that. And managing water related shocks and spillovers, which every model we have tells us are going to increase and not shrink. What are the science and policy implications? Funding. Funding? I'm learning about this as a, as a new scientist, as a new academic, but it's not easy. And it's very competitive. But the opportunity.
opportunity for prizes for breakthroughs and game changers, costs avoided, calculations of the cost we can avoid. And we've been running numbers on cities, by the way, and we've got these very credible numbers of two to three trillion dollar savings if we can reduce water consumption in cities by 30%. And we can do it. So water security, science into policy, some big science challenges. First of all, crossing the disciplinary divides working in silos, that's the tradition of silos. The rewards, the incentives come from within your silo. They come from the great journals. Long-term vision, the rocket science point I've been linking and communicating. So communicating from practice to theory and science, from theory and science to policy and back again. There's two-way streets of communication. Um, without the questions being framed in terms of policy objectives, the wrong science will be done. Without the right, right science, that policy will be, as I said, it will be gambling. Educating the next generation with local to global perspectives. Science coalition, uh, this is this is started. So we're working with McMaster, Oxford, University of Massachusetts, a number of research institutions, other universities. This journey has started. Hub and spoke global network, we're setting data standards, metrics, models for the first time again. We have all of this for many other global initiatives in health, in the oceans, in crime, and so on. We don't have it in fresh water. And that's because of secrecy and sovereignty. Open access cloud data and models, universal early warning systems, we can get to everybody on the planet within five kilometers of mobile phone, even in North Korea. We can go from satellite to to weather, from, to climate, from climate to weather, from weather to river stage, to flood warning, and we can do it now. We need 50 million. We must not fail, this is my call to arms, and I, that's why I'm delighted that you, you, you here in McMaster are moving this agenda. We must not fail. It's, a universe, it's universal human welfare and political security for all of us. Water insecurity, exclusion, marginalization is a risk to us in the wealthy world. Our security as a risk. Water is not local. It was local for a very long time, not local anymore. It's, it now moves all the way to planetary scales, and we have to understand those planetary fluxes. Sovereignty, secrecy, stationarity. Stationarity, the past is the guide to the future. All three of those are dead. Innovation, science and policy, information, institutions, and infrastructure. A bold coalition of the willing. Governments won't move, scientists can move now. We don't need to wait. Governments will follow. But science, ideally with governments, with the willing governments, with civil society and with business, and the McMaster Water Network with the Philomathia Foundation is a founding partner of this coalition. So more ancient wisdom, that's a river, that's a dike. You stick a river on a dike and you get political order and good governance. Rival from the Latin rivalis, one who uses a stream in common with another. Are we going to sink or are we going to swim? We're going to swim. Thank you very much. Well, I think one word sums up the afternoon that for me is inspiring. And I want to thank the panelists that have just left and all of you in the audience for joining us at what is the start of the journey here at McMaster to achieve what David Grayson and I was the challenge of the life. And I particularly heard a few themes that can help us flesh out this idea of the science. It's one that's responsive to the grand challenges, the policy challenges. 
The group has already established and composed a set of principles and actions for the water network to advance the interdisciplinary water research agenda, education, and community engagement. This network is part of a broader set of partnerships in Canada, across North America, and around the globe, which will link us and all of you to universities and to communities and public policy makers around the the network will work in several key areas of science, policy, and technology. And these include, to name just a few, climate, energy, and water, water policy and governance, water quality and treatment, water and health, and water security and globalization. In addition to the generous funding by the Phil Malley Foundation, our provost, Dr. David Wilkinson, has provided seed funding for the Master Water Network which has been matched by funds from the faculties of social science and engineering. It is truly a university-wide initiative. Although in its infancy, the network is well underway. Plans include the McMaster Water Week in the fall, where student showcases and events with the Hamilton community will take place. A part-time water network coordinator will join the team this summer to facilitate action by the group. And a new website, water.mcmaster.ca will provide an online hub for researchers, students, community members, and public policy makers. Over the long term, the network will infuse new ideas for our curriculum and develop new educational programs. We are situated in what for me has always been on one of the great resources of Canada. As a, coming from a family of immigrants whose major um, Summer holidays were spent, I grew up on the prairies, and one year we would drive to the west coast, and the next year as a family, and I'm a family of seven adult sisters, um, we would drive from one coast to the other. And one of the great treats of exploring Canada in that way was in fact to be exposed to the Great Lakes, something which I thought was one of the great wonders of our world. So therefore, McMaster is no better place to lead this initiative to solve the world's water challenges. We're committed to research and education excellence around the issues of water, and we're committed to engaging with each other, our community and policy makers to make a difference. Thank you very much for spending uh, the afternoon with us. Thank you, Dr. Garrett, for putting on such a stimulating afternoon. And now I'd ask you to just join in a round of applause to uh, thank everyone who participated and to celebrate the network, and to finally enjoy the wine and cheese.